Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Martijn. I work for Virus Bulletin, and this is my presentation. Um, at the moment, Orange is doing very exciting things next door, so this is the time for you to reconsider being here. But if you stay here, which I hope you do, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss where we are with email and our fight against email badness, which is spam, and explain that uh, we are actually doing quite well, but we have some problems. Uh, one of the problems is, is people like Enno and, and others here saying, well, 4 billion IP addresses, that's not really enough. And uh, another problem is uh, people like myself and probably many others in this room saying, you know what, we don't like the Americans reading all our emails. Um, there should be plenty of time afterwards for questions. I mean, email security is a broad field. I'm definitely not going to cover uh, the whole of email security so we can have like a nice discussion afterwards, hopefully. Um, one is allowed to have one slide about themselves during a presentation, so this is about me. Um, I have a passport issued by the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, I also grew up there. I went to university to study mathematics. I uh, had a dream of becoming a professional mathematician, but then somehow gave up just before finishing a PhD. And around that time, I also moved to, uh, to England, um, where I joined a company called Virus Bulletin, uh, initially to do its website, but I then I saw that this security thing was actually really cool, and so kind of stayed in security. I set up a comparative spam filter test, which I'm kind of still running, and I'm currently also editor of the of the company, which means that I'm responsible for um, content of anything we publish. We publish lots of technical articles on our website, and also of the conference that we're doing. We have our next conference in Prague in September, and I'm still getting paid in, uh, in British Pound, even though I moved back to uh, another country that still uses the Euro, and which is Greece, which is where I'm based now. Uh, that's not my house, but it's not too far. <coughs> okay, um, anyone here uses email? <laughs> okay. So just for me, so that I know who's actually paying attention. Uh, I think everyone here kind of knows how email works, but just uh, just to explain, just to, so that we all have the, the right concept in our heads. If Alice wants to send an email to Bob, she, she opens her mail client and she writes an email, clicks send, and the mail is submitted to her mail server. Um, after that, the mail ser server, uh, Alice's mail server uses DNS to look up the address of Bob's mail server or one of Bob's mail servers, um, sends the email over the internet, says, hey, there's, hey Bob, there's an email for Bob, it's from Alice. And then Bob's mail server tells Bob, hey, Bob, uh, here's an email. It's from Alice. And this hasn't really changed since the early 1980s. We're still using a protocol which was written and designed for a, a much different internet. And there are two important things to note about this. The first is that Alice can send emails very easily and very fast. Yay, computers, yay, internet. Uh, that's why email is, is much better, at least for, for many purposes, than letters or phone calls. At the same time, and this is, is very important and it's often overlooked, Alice does, can send Bob an email without Bob ever having given her permission. Bob doesn't need to whitelist Alan, Alice doesn't need to follow Alice, as happens on Twitter, if you want to send someone a direct message. Um, she can send this message unsolicited. Now the fact that you can send unsolicited messages and that you can do it very fast and very quickly basically means that the sending of unsolicited bulk email, which is spam, is a feature of email and it's not a bug. And that's I think something that I strongly believe that this is the case and not everyone agrees with me and which means that people on IETF discussion lists about, about email they want to stop spam, and they want, uh, what they don't realize, if you want to stop spam completely, you have to change email. And you have to change one of these two, uh, at least one of these two um, properties. And I think these are actually very important properties of email, properties that we really like. Um, but you know, when I first had looked at the problem of spam, I also thought, hey, but can't we like fix spam or stop spam by fixing email so that Bob needs to actually explicitly give permission. And if you think about it for a, a while, you realize that's not how email works. That's not how we want email to work. 
Um, and indeed, in the 1990s, when the internet became big, there were spammers. And I should point out that I call the spammer Spike here in this presentation, name I made up. Um, in the interest of gender equality, there are also female spammers. Um, so Spike, spammers, they discovered, hey, I can just send Bob an email. I have Bob's email address, and I can ask him if he wants to buy cheap Viagra, which is the, the classic spam. Perhaps Bob, Bob might want a loan offer, or which is for some reason also very popular, fake watches. And a lot more emails, and Bob's inbox could overflow, float a bit, get flooded with spam. Of course, that's not never a problem in IT without a solution, so people started writing spam filters. And the early spam filters, they were content-based. Basically, this is about the only programming you see in this presentation, but uh, this is some uh, but if the email contains the word Viagra, then send it to trash. Otherwise, the email is delivered to Bob, which worked really well when I first wrote a proc mail based filter to uh, filter my email in, in the mid-90s. Uh, this is what I did, more or less. And it worked well until spammers went one step further. They started using all sorts of tricks to bypass these filters. For example, spelling Viagra like this. I'm sure that everyone has seen this. I mean, this isn't rocket science. This is not something that I assume is new to most of you. But this happened, and indeed, this bypassed spam filters, after which spam filters got updated, sometimes automatically using all sorts of Bayesian statistics, etc. It got a kind of cat and mouse game. I just want to show off that I'm very good at finding icons on the internet. Uh, a cat and mouse game be be between spammers on the one hand and spam filters on the other hand. Um, that's what happened in the 90s, and in, in, a, in a sense that's still going on, but a very important change came well, roughly beginning of this century when spammers realized, hold on, I can use a botnet of hi hijacked computers, and I can send a lot of spam. And spammers also realized that because email doesn't have some kind of authentication, they could just pretend to be someone else. And this made spam filtering quite hard. And when this started to happen, people started to think, hold on, isn't this email thing like totally broken? I mean, anyone can rent a botnet. Anyone can bombard Bob or millions of Bobs with emails claiming to come from someone else. An email just does not have some built-in mechanism to, to verify the source of these emails. And indeed, there were very clever people who thought, you know, spam is just going to kill email. And it hasn't. But this does, didn't seem such a strange thought, because it looked like spam, sending spam skilled so well that even if spam filters blocked 99%, this 1% was still so much to make email unusable. But as I said, that didn't happen, because we, are, we as, as an anti-spam community, were cleverer than that. And the spam problem hasn't been stopped, and I explained why I think it can't be stopped, but it's well mitigated using a number of, of ways. I list a quite a few. Uh, there are probably others that I've forgotten. Um, Content-based filters still play a role. Um, blacklist of IP addresses from which spam is sent and domains from which spam is sent or which appears in the body of the email play a very important role, especially IP-based blacklist. That um, an educated guess is that about 90% of spam is blocked simply because the sender's IP address is on a blacklist. That's something to keep in mind because I'll refer to that later on. Um, outbound spam filtering, which means that ISPs uh, either just simply blocked the sending of emails unless you use their, uh, their own mail server, or they started filtering the emails outbound. Um, this contributed as well. Uh, takedowns of botnets. The spam actually was at its worst around late 2008 when a number of botnet takedowns really helped to reduce at least the volume of spam. It's still very big, but it's not as big as it was back then. Legislation, if you're like me and you approach this problem from a technical angle, legislation is, is boring, but it actually helps to prevent legitimate companies from sending spam. And that's why it's in a hidden way very important. And three techniques called SPF, DKIM, and DMARC that I'll explain in a bit. Uh, they start playing a very important role. 
Um, it's good to know that how filters work, in a, uh, taking a very broad picture. Um, Anti-spam people, spam filter companies, uh, researchers, they set up uh, honeypots, which in the case of spam are usually called spam traps. These honeypots receive emails, because if you send a million or a billion emails, you can't really distinguish between real users and fake ones. Um, these, the, the content of these emails and their the metadata, like IP address and domain, they are sent back to the spam filters, which are then improved, uh, together with occasionally some, some feedback from unhappy uh, people who received spam, and this is how spam filters improve. This also means that spam filtering is almost entirely done reactively. It's not done proactively. Um, anyone here in this room can register the domain, rent a VPS, set up a mail server, and start sending spam. If you send 10 or 100 emails spam, you're probably going to get them delivered, even if you're trying to sell Viagra. But you can't scale it. Right, I, pr I promise to explain uh, how a few of these new techniques work. SPF um, works as follows, and it's good to know that, that, that from a spam filter's point of view, uh, it's this bit between the two mail servers that's tricky, that, that's hard, that's, but the problem is that's where no authentication takes place. What it does is if an email that claims to come from Alice is sent over such a connection, coming from an IP address, say, 1234, then the receiving mail server can do a DNS lookup and ask, can this IP address, is this IP address allowed to send mail for this domain? And if the answer is yes, it doesn't mean it's not spam, but it makes it less likely. Likewise, if the answer is no, we would like it to mean this must be spam and forged. Unfortunately, it's generally a bit more complicated than that, but it really helps to make uh, an informed decision. DKIM is something else. DKIM signs emails. Uh, DKIM means mail servers sign emails. Basically, they, they tie it to a domain. And again, you can use it. Hey, well, if it's signed by this domain, you at least know that it was um, sent by this uh, mail server. It doesn't mean it's not spam, but it makes it less likely. And you can help. You can use this in a decision whether or not to deliver an email, or you uh, a spam filter can do. DMARC is a really, really new technique that's mostly used by the very big email senders like like Yahoo and, and Gmail and Microsoft. Um, it's kind of cool. It combines SPF and DKIM in the following, in, in two ways. Firstly, it allows uh, a sending domain to, to give guidance of what to do with emails that uh, didn't have a DKIM signature or an invalid one, or that failed SPF yet claimed to come from this domain. And you can say, well, block them all together, which is very radical and probably gives you some problems. But if you like PayPal, then you might want to do that because Phishing is such a big problem for a company like PayPal. You can also say, well, uh, treat it with suspicion or put it in quarantine, don't delete it, etc. Um, this is really helpful for the mail servers. And the second part, the DMARC, and it's a less known part, is it also allows you as a domain to say, well, if you do get emails that claim to come from us, but they fail either SPF or DKIM, uh, send us a report on them. Because this could mean two things. It could mean someone is forging the domain, or it could mean SPF or DKIM records aren't uh, set up well. I, at, our at our conference last year, a guy from Microsoft gave a presentation. Microsoft is an enormous company. Uh, it's very hard to, to, for them to know which, ser mail servers, which servers sent email on their behalf. Uh, so they use this, this feedback mechanism in DMARC together with a very relaxed policy at, at first to improve their own SPF and DKIM settings. And now they have fairly strict settings which apparently really helps uh, delivery of good mail and, uh, uh, and also prevents the delivery of emails that claim to come from one of Microsoft's domains. So to summarize the first part of this presentation uh, with a quote from an authority, not necessarily on the area of spam, but on security in general, um, Bruce Schneier called spam a rare success story in, in cybercrime. Uh, indeed, uh, the kind of catch rates we get um, means that uh, makes people fighting malware, fighting DDoS attacks, fighting all sorts of other bad things, really jealous. Um, it's still a problem. There are still spam messages being sent around. Some of them get a malicious payload. People click on them, get infected with a, 
uh, encryption ransomware, that's bad, but it's, it's extremely well mitigated and it's really hard to, to improve on this, I think. Uh, I'm not saying you can't improve on, the, on this, but if you want to, to, do, to improve, you need to know how well we're already doing. Um, but it's also good to know that the infrastructure itself remains vulnerable to, to big changes. If we, make, if we make big changes, our mitigation mechanisms might stop working. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the second part of this presentation, which is now. So there are people like, like Enno who think 4 billion IP addresses is not enough, we need more. Um, and this has some consequences of, uh, for email, and in particular for spam filtering. So this, uh, I assume everyone knows I, IP6 is, is a new protocol for sending uh, internet packets. Uh, packets have longer addresses and there are much more addresses as well. Basically, there, there are very few IP4 addresses and in, pra uh, in practice, an infinite number of IP6 addresses. Now there's good news and bad news about the move to IP6 and its consequences for email. Um, if you know about various layers uh, of network uh, traffic, um, email takes place in the application layer, I think it's layer seven. I'm very bad, it's a high number. Uh, IP6 is a network layer thing, which means that if, if you write a, a mail server from scratch, it works for IP6 and IP4 just as well. Yay. So we don't have to worry about it. Except, as I already hinted earlier, Spam filtering makes heavy use of IP4 addresses. It uses them to block 90% of spam, more or less, uh, based on the IP4 address being on a blacklist. <coughs> However, as some people point out, we don't need that many mail servers. I mean, we need IP6 addresses because 4 billion IP4 or 3 billion, as we can use in, in practice, is simply not enough. But for mail servers, there are probably a few million mail servers at the most. IP4 is just enough. Um, and and it's, it's really, again, on, only about the traffic between the mail servers where spam filtering is, is important, where it matters. We could, we could say we just give these all an IP4 address and we, we forget about the IP6 thing for them. Which is true. Unfortunately, or, and I'm not even sure if I think that's unfortunate, IP6 is a momentum. It's a very slow momentum and it's still not happening as fast as people like it to happen, but it's going to happen. And I think mail servers will start using IP6 and are starting to use IP6. Uh, Google, uh, Comcast in the US already two years ago, and there's probably more now, uh, are accepting email over IP6. Solutions, well, some people uh, say, well, you can just make blacklist adopt to IP6. Uh, this is what a uh, a lookup against the blacklist, so you would look at a DNS lookup against this very long domain. If you can't read it, that's my point. Um, it works, it works in theory. Um, especially, well, it would really help if people then followed the rules. And, and the rules are that ISP should never assign any segment smaller than a slash 64 to, uh, to end users and something bigger if it's a larger organization and then you can ignore the rest of the IP address because uh, it's the same company that is sent, has been sending spam or hasn't been sending spam. Uh, unfortunately, and I know probably knows better than I do, but I, I don't think people are really following the rules. And even if they were, um, uh, it's still uh, about a billion, uh, sp sorry, um, even if people were following the rules, IP6 blacklists would be about a billion times larger than IP4 blacklists. And an IP4 blacklist uh, can fit within half a gigabyte. And we would be talking about a billion, half a billion gigabyte times, half a billion billion gigabyte. I'm not sure if I'm saying, a lot. We're talking about very, <laughs> very large and, and practically unmanageable. I think a better solution would be is to say, you know what, IP addresses, they're, very, they're kind of unnatural to make email decisions based on it. It, it, it works extremely well in practice. I, I think organizations like Spamhouse, Sorbs, who set up this blacklist, are doing great work. Um, but it's just very unnatural. I mean, I, I, I know about email, I look into these things, and I wouldn't know the IP addresses of our company's mail servers. But of course, I would know the domain. I would know which domain we're using to send email. So perhaps we should use SPF and DKIM, both, both of which make... Uh, 
user the domain. And what's actually really nice about I the move to IP6 is that you can't suddenly start making SPF and DK mandatory on for email on IP4 because there are just too many mail servers out there running old software. It just wouldn't work. But IP6 being a new thing, you can say, I'm not accepting IP6 email unless it has a DKIM signature and or it's, uh, valid, uh, it passes SPF. And at least Google is actually doing that for Gmail. Right. There's another problem, which I actually think is even bigger. Um, let's look again at Alice sending an email to Bob. And look at eyes that have been colored by 20 months of Snowden revelations. Uh, about NSA spying email. And, and as you point out, it, uh, there may be people in the room who think the NSA is absolutely fine. Uh, if you think that, and you're absolutely right, uh, you're, it, it's, you're allowed to think that, of course. Um, China is probably also interested in the content of emails. Um, the email from Alice to her mail server is not always, but almost always encrypted. And as you point out, in this case, it might not even be sending the email. Alice might just look in, log into Gmail to, to send the email. There might not even be a connection over the internet. That's not really a problem. The problem is the, e the connection from one mail server to another. There has been a significant increase in the, this, these connections being uh, encrypted using star TLS. But it doesn't mean that all connections are uh, encrypted. A lot of smaller mail servers still don't support star TLS. Uh, many do support star TLS, but uh, for example, in the case of, of Hillary Clinton's email server, which was in the news recently, uh, don't uh, ch check the certificate if it's valid, which means that um, an advanced adversary with a man in the middle position could read your email. Um, but there's also nothing that either Alice or Bob can do to control this. They can't say, uh, send this email only if the connection is encrypted. That's not how email works. It's kind of, we have to hope that this email is, that the connection is encrypted. Connection from Bob's mail over to Bob, again, is, is generally encrypted. That's not something we worry about. But even if all the connections are encrypted, there are still the two mail servers where, uh, that have access to the unencrypted emails, which make them vulnerable to someone hacking into them and, and reading all all the emails, and if it's not about hacking, then perhaps they just come with a government order saying we need access to these emails, which is kind of what happened to, uh, with PRISM. Of course, we all use PGP. Anyone who uses PGP? Anyone who uses PGP who claims to never mess up? Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, I definitely mess up all the time. Um, so looking at PGP, for those who don't know, Alice, signs her email, sorry, Alice encrypts her email with a private key to which Bob and other people have a public key. Um, no, that's the wrong way around. Alice signs her email using a private key so that Bob can then read it, but she also uses Bob's public key to, to encrypt it so that Bob has his own private key, that's what the icon next to Bob's face, uh, to, to decrypt the email. This is uh, Alice signing the email. So when it gets to, to Bob, Bob can read it. It's good to note what, is act, actually, what PGP actually means in practice. Alice encrypts her email using what she has been made to believe is Bob's private key. Bob is then able to verify using RSA encryption. Yeah, okay, okay, that's, that's wrong, okay. Uh, well, can you imagine, I mean, can you imagine? Okay, <laughs> Alice encrypts her email using um, what she has been made to believe is Bob's public key, yes. Unless Alice emails a uh, Swedish newspaper which twice in recently published its own private key on its website. <laughs> but Bob is not working for that newspaper, uh, apologize for that. Um, the second statement, Bob was able to verify that the email was sent by someone in possession. What he has been made to believe is Alice's private key. I think that is correct. Thanks, guys. Um, so this is what it really means. I mean, this is not what I teach you in crypto class, but this is what PGP really means. And, and what we want it to mean, and what I teach you in crypto class is, of course, 
Alice encrypts the email so that only Bob can read it, and Bob can then verify, apart from reading it, can also verify the email really came from Alice. It, it generally works, it generally means this in practice if we, people like us, use PGP and we don't mess up, but we do mess up and if PGP were somehow to be adopted widely, then more and more people would mess up and this translation simply wouldn't scale. And PGP has another problem, it leaks a lot of metadata. And there's been a lot of discussion about metadata. There's a very funny slide about metadata from CCC from two years ago, uh, which I, I'm sure everyone has seen. Uh, and in the case of email, think of the following situation. You're a journalist. You get 10 emails on a day. Nine of them are unencrypted. One of them is PGP encrypted. And also, and the next day, you write something on, in your newspaper uh, which showing that you've been in contact with a whistleblower. That really helps someone hacking into your email or demanding access to email. Uh, make a very edu educated guess about who this whistleblower is. So re leaking metadata really matters for email. Now, a few things I could to keep in mind. I mean, uh, we're all. Very, I'm very worried about NSA in China and, and BND, perhaps spying on us. Um, but most people, it doesn't affect people's lives. It doesn't affect my life that the NSA reads my email, or ha yeah, did read my email perhaps. Also, there are billions of people using email every day. Um, they're fine with it, it's working. Uh, spam is not really a problem anymore, not, not, not a problem making people stop email, so they're not gonna change. At least not easily. <coughs> and crypto is hard. Uh, I messed up my, my slides by confusing public and private keys, and I even, at least I know what public and private keys are. Most people don't know, shouldn't know, um, so any solution to this, this problem of uh, adversaries reading emails uh, that depends on people understanding crypto is bound to fail. There's a solution. Well, there are a number of people who've written solutions. There's one I'd like to pick out because I'm very excited about it and I think it's, it's by far the most likely to, to be implemented even if it might take another 10 years. It's called DIME, which stands for Dark Internet Mail Environment. I should make it clear, I have no relationship to, the, to this protocol, I've not been involved in any way, I just like it. People who have been involved, by the way, are people like Lada Levison, who set up LavaBit, uh, John Callas from Silent Circle, and Phil Zimmerman from PGP. DIME is based on two slight modifications to how email works. And the first is, every email Every connection, well, email makes various steps. It's always encrypted, and the only thing that's, that uh, the receiving party can read is the thing that really matters. Or sorry, that they both can read is the thing that really matters. Um, when Alice sends an email to Bob, her mail server doesn't need to know it's for Bob. All it needs to know is it has to be delivered to someone on Bob's domain. And especially if Bob uses his ISP's domain or, or a webmail domain, uh, that really doesn't reveal anything about Bob. Uh, the, the email sent uh, over the public internet, it's encrypted apart from very basic metadata, the two domains, which you kind of know already because you see the email uh, traveling between one mail server and another. That generally gives you an idea about which domain is being used. And likewise, Bob's mail server never knew that Aunt Alice sent this email. He just knew that it was someone from Alice's domain. That's one part, that, that emails are, are very much encrypted, or dime messages, I should say. They're very much encrypted, and there's very uh, little metadata available. And they're encrypted sometimes, uh, multiple times, so that uh, different parties can access the right, only that data that they need. And the second part is that DMTP, which is a, an extension to SMTP, which is a, the Mills delivery protocol. Um, it, apart from the sending of, of DIME messages, it also allows people to look up uh, public keys. And, which means that Bob and Bob's mail server can use Alice's mail server to check if this is a private, uh, is a public key of, of Alice. And um, sometimes they forward this request to, to Alice. I'm, as I said, very excited about DIME, and there are a number of reasons. 
it's written by people who understand encryption, and there are more people who understand encryption who've written something. But they also understand email, and they understand how people use email every day. And this is pro probably the most important. It, it integrates seamlessly into email. Um, it's basically a system that would work next to email. You've got mail servers that support email and Dime. You've got mail clients that would support email and Dime. You would send someone a message. It would try Dime first on port 26 if it didn't work. Uh, if you couldn't look up the keys, etc., it would work on port 25, which is the email port. Also, if you think about webmail providers, Gmail, Hotmail, uh, GMX in, in Germany, Mailru in Russia, if you think about these from a privacy point of view, it's a disaster. I mean, people, people trusting providers, perhaps in a different country, but people like it. And, and Dime explicitly allows you to place trust in a server. Say, OK, I trust Gmail server, at least with some of my keys. Perhaps I need an encryption password, but at least I trust them enough to see the encrypt, encrypt, to store my encrypted private key there. But also, it allows you to completely not trust your, your provider and store everything on your own uh, devices. And users don't need to understand crypto. To, to paraphrase uh, Lada Levison, one of the people behind Dime recently on a crypto mailing list, uh, you don't need a PhD in math to use Dime. Uh, given that I always fail in, when I use PGP, and given that I never got a PhD in math, I was really charmed by this. But then I come from an anti-spam background, and, and I re read the specification, which is 108 page long. It's not even done yet. Lots of TBDs in there, but uh, but the word spam isn't mentioned once, not even once. And it's good to keep in mind: spam filters they inspect email, as does the NSA, or China, or the BND, or whoever, whichever is your least favorite. Uh, Intelligent agency. And you can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, we trust spam filters, but we don't trust, but we make it sure that NSA can't read their email. I mean, if anything, the NSA, etc., could compromise these spam filters or could demand access to them, could demand the backdoor. And also, it's good to keep in mind spammers can use encryption. I mean, the fact that Dime, everything in Dime is encrypted doesn't stop spammers. I, I sometimes speak to people who think, well, if only we encrypted all our emails, then that would stop the spam problem because spammers tend to not use encryption. But they could. Just like DKIM and SPF are not in themselves uh, solutions to the spam problem, even if spam that, ver uh, that uh, passes SPF or is DKIM signed is still fairly rare, spammers could use that. Spammers could set it up. But I have reasons to be optimistic. Um, firstly, I think it's good to know that, as I said in the first part of my presentation, we collectively have been very good at fighting spam. And that means I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm sure that whatever solution, if it's Dime or something else, we come up with to make emails more encrypted. I'm sure we'll somehow uh, uh, solve this problem. Not 100%, but then we can't stop spam 100% anyway. And Dime includes various levels of security and trust. Um, all emails are encrypted, all emails are authenticated. That really would help. Uh, spam filtering would be very, made a lot easier if we at least could be sure about this. I mean, this basically means uh, a much better version of DKIM and SPF. And also, all emails would be signed and encrypted. Um, so what do I think will, will happen if we do uh, adopt Dime, which I hope will do, even if it might take another 10 years before it's, it's really widely adopted. And it's good, then it's, it's something very important to note. S sending spam requires a one way infrastructure. You set up a botnet, for example, you, you rent a botnet, you, you create a botnet, and these machines send email. That's fine. That, that's all they do, that works. Lots of it gets blocked, but probably if you send enough, then that's enough to make uh, a decent return on investment. In Dime, you need a two-way infrastructure because you need some servers that can be used to uh, that can be um, queried for your public keys. That's a lot harder to set up. That's also a lot more 
a lot easier to take down or to block. Uh, therefore, I think spam will is likely to decrease in quantity. It, it just spam, sending emails, sending spam just won't scale as well. But I think there will be an increase in, in quality, by meaning good spam, it's hard to filter, uh, because spammers will be forced to use dedicated accounts with much smaller spam runs. Um, you already see a trend, you know, if, there, there's a, if you're a spammer, you get your hands on the, 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 the the users, uh, user data from the recent Anthem breach, you can send very targeted spam emails. They're much less likely to be blocked. These users are much more likely to, uh, to really exist, to have be real email addresses. Uh, that will increase, and spammers will also uh, be forced to use compromised accounts. Whether that's a good thing, I mean, whether the quantity, which is generally seen as the biggest problem of spam, if we reduce that, um, but we have to pay the price that the quality of spam will be better. But that's a good thing, I'm not sure. Uh, time will tell. Uh, that's my email address. Uh, email doesn't require you to opt in, so feel free to send me an email. You don't have to, I don't have to approve you as a, as a sender. That's my Twitter account. If you thought it was very boring, you know who to unfollow. And that's our company website, and there should be plenty of time, 20 minutes or so, for questions. I expect that Andreas to have a question, but I should say not just questions, also comments. Perhaps you have found this way to solve spam that I had or, or other problems with email that I had overlooked. Feel free to let them know. Was that an attempt to, to ignore him? No, no, no. Andreas, can I? Uh, this is the I mean, first time. We, we could try it. Like, oh, there's a guy over there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but okay, now uh, that's. Uh, so uh, I haven't heard about time. Okay. Yes. So is that a part of the DIME specification? Yes. That you have to provide your own CA? Not so much a CA. Uh, there's a lot of technical crypto, which um, I haven't read. I have read it, but I haven't remembered it enough to, to talk here about uh, um, as an authoritative voice. But uh, this is important. You need to at least have servers that can be queried for your keys. Uh, in, in, in email, you don't need this, and it needs to go both ways. Uh, and I should also point out, I'm not sure if I made this clear, DIME, if you haven't heard of it, it's because it's not implemented yet. There are some, there's, the specifications aren't even ready, they're still looking for comments. Um, one thing you mentioned is with the transport layer security is that for whatever the government or whoever is yeah, getting physical contact to the server, they yeah. can easily play man in the middle. How is this prevented by this protocol? Because if I have physical contact to the server, I can easily yeah, fake Bob's uh, public key. So when Alice is, is writing an email to Bob, she's looking up the, the public key, and she's getting a fake key. And when it's going over my server, so how is this prevented here? It, it, it's, it's done by various layers of security. And again, I. I and, and encryption and, and, okay. and authentication, including DNS, including some kind of CA infrastructure. Uh, I didn't want to focus on that because I didn't want it to be a technical crypto talk, so I haven't remembered all the details. They're still looking for comments. They, uh, they're aware that people will try to attack this. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, um, men in the middle link is not going to be easy at the very least and probably very hard. Um, and the reason I ignored S-MIME is that it's generally ignored. People don't use it. Well, well I, I know people use it, but not many people use it. Oh, a lot of people use it. Okay. Actually, I, 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 would, um, okay. I, I, I wouldn't agree with that one. Me as a person, some of you might have, uh, not that I think they are very important, but when you ask a question, who is using PGP? I didn't raise my hand. 
and that was for the explicit reason that I don't like PGP. I consider it yeah. semi-proprietary. I do smart card based as mine all the day. I mean, it's an, uh, and I do it with a number of um, communication partners. So I, I'm not into that, uh, but uh, it's probably a certain kind of organizations using as mine. Yeah, OK, th th that's fair enough. And it's also good to know that um, Dime Dime emails are based on MIME and SMIME. SMIME has been an inspiration for Dime. <laughs> so uh, there's that, that, something called DMIME or something. That, the, the, the Dime message have a formal name. I think it's called D slash MIME, which is based on S slash MIME. And it's the same idea. Question at the back? Sure, sure, yeah. That's the, yeah, that's, I mean, I know there are other people working on different protocols, and sometimes even the same people working on different protocols. Uh, I'm not sure if Dime will, will be the one that survives. I think it has backing of important, uh, clever people behind it. I think. A lot of Leveson is going around talking to lots of big companies that might want to adopt it, but there might be others. And, and one problem with Dime is um, if you want to send an email now and you're really worried about it being read, then Dime is completely useless because it's not implemented yet. So using PGP or SMIME or, or some other encryption that might be easier to set up at least for a smaller group is, is very useful. Klaus. Two questions. Um, open PGP was mentioned. The, yeah. Also, there's the um, I, I've not looked at this particular ones. I've looked at a few of these. Uh, Alex Stamos just announced the new Yahoo. Yes. Uh, that I've, uh, Yahoo is, is make, making it easier to use uh, PGP on Yahoo, as is Gmail um, doing. Um, the problem is it still needs to be a user deciding to do that, and, and it takes two to. Uh, uh, to email, well, to email on a text too, to use encrypted email. Uh, if you're excited and you ha you use PGP and I don't, then the email will be unencrypted. But, and the metadata will still be leaked. The and case. the metadata will still be leaked in, in any case, yes. Which is, of course, a huge disadvantage in that respect. Second question is, um, and this might be a stupid question, uh, spam filters inspect email, you said. Yes. That's what they do. Yes. Yes. How for perfect forward secrecy does that work? Um, okay, yeah. I, I was hoping someone would ask a question about perfect forward secrecy. <laughs> perfect forward secrecy uh, in email, if you look at it from an academic cryptography point of view, perfect forward secrecy is impossible in email or DIME or anything that's uh, not syn uh, synchronous. Like uh, Alice sends an email now, Bob reads it later, etc. Bob's computer doesn't need to be on with his, uh, with his private key on it. That means it, in theory, private, uh, perfect forward secrecy or, or forward secrecy is impossible. I should point out forward secrecy is the idea that uh, if someone steals your private key or hits you on the head with a wrench and gets your private key, then uh, they can encrypt all your past and future traffic or decrypt all your past and future traffic. So it takes one key to decrypt them all um, until you change keys. Uh, th that's been a big problem in, in web servers that are moving away from keys uh, supporting or not supporting PGP, uh, sorry, P, perfect for PFS. Um, in email, as I said, in email and, and DIME, it's impossible in theory. In practice, DIME allows for very fast key uh, rotation, which means that what you get if you roto ro rotate your key every hour, that's probably just as good in practice as forward secrecy. Um, your question was about spam folders. I'm not sure if I understand what spam folders have to do with it. You know. That's why I said it might be a stupid question. No, it was not a stupid question. I think the perfect forward secrecy was, was not a stupid, stupid question at all. Uh, I just, yeah, but yeah. So it, uh, if you get this question asked tomorrow in, in crypto class at university, no, 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 perfect forward secrecy is impossible. If your boss asks it, yeah, it kind of is. Anything else? Anything else? Yes.
what about IPv6? Yes. So you said um, the blacklist will become much bigger? Yes. I'm, I would disagree to a certain point, but because, uh, let's say, company, my company has Ledge 48. Yes. And you could just have one entry. You don't have an entry for each Ledge 64 for my company. You just have one for, for the domain, and this domain is behind Ledge 48. Yes, uh, that's true. There are a few things. Firstly, the blacklist provider needs to know that the slash 48 is really your company. It needs to have like an independent, some kind of way. He can look this up, this information. Yeah, okay, the, but that's, the, an extra that's an extra lookup. And they, and they need to, this, uh, this who is data stuff needs to be correct. That's not always the case. Uh, secondly, it means that if you, in this slash 48, you host a mail server and a web server, your web server gets compromised, so starts sending spam then your mail server will be blocked as well. That's in, in a, if you talk to people who are in favor of IP6 blacklist, say, well, um, good riddance, you shouldn't have had your web server be compromised. I think it shows that IP-based filtering is an inherently bad idea that up to now works extremely well. Uh, th that's my opinion, and, and opinions vary on this. I can just say that we enabled IP6 on there yeah. two months ago, and we don't no. have any impact. So I just check this. Uh, yeah. No, no, uh, for now, spammers, it's not interesting spammers. As far as I know, the only spam that's been sent over IP6 is to spam that uses the default TCP connection to a domain, uh, or, and that happened to be IP6, but, yeah. Thanks again, Klaus. <laughs>